Hey guys, welcome back to Gfinity, uh, live from London, UK. I'm joined by Admirable and Caldi. Uh, Caldi just casted that last match. You're doing okay, man. Yeah, you need I'm a Red Bull or, yeah. or four? <laughs> uh, just had some coffee. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm rolling, yeah. All right, that's good. And of course, Admirable, you, how did you enjoy that match? You got to sit out there in the sidelines. Yeah, it, you know, I mean, long matches are always something you're going to see when you have a lot of control versus control, mm -hmm. but a lot of high-level stuff was going on and mm -hmm. a lot of tough decisions that the players are having to make back and forth, and that's really one of the biggest tests of Hearthstone is those long control matches. It, it, it's live mm -hmm. coach, and it's not called Rolf coach for, you know, no reason, I suppose, yeah. Uh, yeah. So he does that, tend to bring those control decks and, and uh, think out the turns for sure, so his series will be quite long. Yeah, I'm just sad he didn't bring the Mech Warrior, man. He's been destroying a couple of leagues with it online. He just didn't bring it to offline tournaments, but you know, maybe it's not perfected yet. Maybe Black Rock Mountain or a certain pack in the metagame can develop. Maybe he's probably doing some sort of Axe Flinger version or something, you know, to go for next level. Dude, Warrior. <laughs> Axe Flinger is a really sick underrated card. Until yeah. people realize it, like I was showing Tice when I was staying with him a couple of days in the Netherlands, the power of Axe Flinger. And then he brought it to uh, NVIDIA match, I think, or Ding It match, and he won with it. Mm -hmm. I was like, yeah, it's really good. Well, that's one of the big, is sick. Yeah, one of the biggest things that's most interesting about that card is stuff like Inner Rage and Cruel Taskmaster. Right. They're, when you have them in your hand, you're so often using them as effects to deal one damage to something your opponent has and regaining tempo and trying to utilize that tempo. But when you have Axe Flinger, those cards turn into four damage effects, like Cruel Taskmaster right. getting a 2-2 and then dealing four damage and Inner Rage being zero mana and dealing four damage. Those are very, very strong burn cards. Like Soul Fire all Yeah, and, and something that's like really shot. common. Like, what? I'm a hunter? <laughs> something that's really common in those yeah. in other card games, the strategies like that, isn't the quality of the burn spells you have, it's just how many burn spells you have. Because right. eventually, if you have enough of them, almost regardless of how bad they are, you can build some powerful strategies with it. Well, uh, let's, not, let's not get too ahead of ourselves, guys. Uh, I mean, I do know that we can theory craft about Axe Flinger all day, and I'd personally love it. Hitting the face is fun. <laughs> but we have a really good match where I, I, I'm sure we're going to see plenty of face uh, between these guys. we got a Korean player, Tang, up against the Salt Nad himself, the creator of Tempo Store, man of Hearthstone, it's Ray Nad. Uh, it's going to be a fun one because I think it's, if this series goes the way that maybe how we'll, all three of us will predict, or maybe Ray Nad's not as prepared as, as he should be, and maybe the fact that Tang is unknown, he's a Korean player who might be playing just like unabashed, shameless face decks, right? And just like, because that's what <laughs> Koreans love. Koreans love being aggressive sometimes. Then uh, maybe maybe we'll see like an upset and we'll get a golden interview later on. So that, that's what I'm looking forward to, man. Do you just want it to be like the absolute, <laughs> just lowest of the low point? Like, I've been traveling a lot. I'm really tired. He's tired. And then, of course, yeah, he just faced cranky. me all through. That's what he's looking forward to the most. That'd be hilarious, man. Come well, on. it would be. It's part um, of the fun. It, there is something to be noted about the amount of travel that he's been doing, though. I mean, he just came right. back from, seat, I mean, he went from Seat Story back home. To back here. Yeah, the, the fire bat route. He, That's the, what fire bat did too. Yeah, he, he was home for 19 hours, he said to me the other day when we were when I was talking to him. It's, that it's much crazy. travel really does weigh on your ability to make you know perfect decisions. So it, to see that influenced by his deck building and choosing something more aggressive, uh, that wouldn't surprise me. Um, but as far as Tang is concerned, you, like, you mentioned that Koreans like to be aggressive, but they're aggressive a lot of times in unique ways. You don't always see it just be early aggression. It's just weird combos. Like at Kranich, for instance, at Worlds, he played the Raging Organ combo, and basically no one was playing that sort of deck. Mm -hmm. It wouldn't surprise yeah. me to see something very unique and interesting True. from him, and at the same time, Raynad choosing to go with more aggressive strategies. I think the thing to consider with uh, Tang is he's had maybe hasn't been traveling as much, but the travel from Korea is really, really long and exhausting. So I think that maybe I think we can consider, That's I suppose, yeah. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I still, you know, traveling a lot now versus normal, it's yeah. a lot worse now because there's also new cars coming out. So you have to test them, you know, immediately. So you, you know, he may not have a lot of experience with the new cars. So that can play a big role, I think. I just wonder uh, how much that has an, the external imp factors have an impact on the actual game itself, the deck preparation, because it seems like lineups are, detect are dictating the outcome of these series a lot more than maybe the individual plays themselves, as long as you play them reasonably well. It seems like, uh, like Firebass lineup, I think, carried him throughout the entire series. He just got really good matchups throughout the entire thing. Mm -hmm. And Life Coach, almost the same exact thing going into the second series. Maybe this time will be different. Uh, we actually have an update on how the groups have panned out thus far, because there's actually a lot of stuff going on. There's two stages here at Gfinity. So uh, Zozus did defeat Kroba even though he lost a Firebat. So that means Zozus goes into second place at that group. Of course, Firebat was able to advance and as you saw on stream. And uh, that's a pretty cool opportunity. Oh wait, sorry, miss, I misspoke. Kroba then defeated Zozus in the, uh, the match. So Kroba uh, lost to Zozus initially. Sorry, I read, I read that. Yeah. I, I actually misread that. 
Well, that's one of, the three, it's one, of the, <laughs> it's one of the three player groups. And so this right. is one of these unique, uh, you know, not having a third player, it's, you know, these guys had to rematch to decide who's going to be the second person to advance. That's right. Groups. That's right. So, you know, we saw Zozus, he didn't quite get his revenge match versus Firebat, and then Crobat did get his revenge yeah, match. Yeah, so Crobat advanced, and he's Zosus. the guy who said, hey, I'm coming here to have fun. So yeah. maybe it, it might not be as important as advancing, but he did. Another thing to consider is that Zozus, who got second place last time, is now out of the tournament. A really sad, sad thing. Yeah. Especially after, you know, beating uh, Kroba in the first match. You know, uh, so, quite sad. I mean, that's that's what you got to do, man. You got to be the best every time. You can't just be the the best once. As you saw, uh, RDU uh, did end up winning his series there and Faramir faced off against Airbrush. And then going to Group C, we're still waiting on Raynad versus Tang. And, and then the winner and losers will separate accordingly. Uh, this is a double elimination group or two advance. It's best of five conquest. So, pretty straightforward from this point on. Uh, the winner of this, we're going to play life coach. The loser faces Buddy Muffins. Looking at the last bracket, um, Movis yesterday, he was asked which player did he fear most in his group, and he said it was Airbrushed. Right. But Airbrushed and Movitz both lost, lost their first yeah. matches in their groups. <laughs> and, uh, you know, RDU kind of gave him the look. We were, we well, were sitting around in the, in the player lounge. More specifically, Movitz said, like, RDU tilts too easily. <laughs> and he's like, he thinks RDU is the easiest opponent in the group, and he lost to him. So yeah. I think RDU is definitely vindicated. And plus, I know, I know Radu tried really hard for this tournament. He practiced a ton. He laddered so much, and he prepped for hours. So I think he's one of the threats to take it all when he's like that, when he's, he's on fire. Yeah, he's always a threat, I think. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, of course, uh, we have one more group in uh, Group D. Powder took out uh, Ivy Dutch Boy, and then, of course, this happened yesterday. Off stream, Powder defeated Orange, and Orange uh, narrowly lost to Dutch Boy. So that's our top eight so far, uh, as Dutch Boy and Powder were able to go through. Really fun stuff so far, but uh, I'm looking forward to this match a lot just because I want to see what Korea has to offer. People consider Korea as uh, one of the weakest regions in Hearthstone, uh, at least the one that's broadcasted. I mean, I guess you could take the Antarctica region. There's no one really good there. <laughs> but when I look at the, the, the totem pole in terms of the, the power rankings of regions, I put Korea towards the bottom. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's sort of interesting you say that. We don't get to see too much of Korea, really outside of the OGN stuff. Right. There's not that much of it that's broadcast. Um, but what I've seen so far, it's like it's been really strong. Kranich, of course, I mean, that guy's an excellent player. Um, but the amount of quality from Korea so far, it seems like it's been very limited into the number of players. And when you have that happening, the practice pool, when it's that small, you're going to see the players within that practice pool. They will struggle a little bit because you need a deeper practice pool of players to play against. Like, there's no shortage of players from NA or EU to practice with. And in Korea, maybe you are seeing that shortage. It's true. This is like one of the few games where Korea is lumped up to other regions, Taiwan and, and Asia, Vers yeah. you, versus like other games. Korea has its own region because it's so competitive, right? When they have their own top of the ladders. I think the thing to consider is uh, our practice with both uh, Kranich and, uh, and uh, the uh, SK player. Uh, and, and Rainiauer. Rainiauer, and yeah. Masson. It's been a while, but uh, that, they, uh, they're just pulling every Korean player I know. <laughs> <laughs> they're like excellent players, both of them. And Magic Amy. Actually, to see like both Magic both Rainiauer and, and Kranitz, you know, like not do that well in the Korean leagues tells me that the Korean leagues is going to be quite strong. Mm -hmm. They play excellent Hearthstone, but they feel sometimes like the decks are maybe like one week behind Europe, which. Tends That's to put them point. a bit behind, but the play is excellent, yeah, so when it comes to decision-making there. Right, actually, I know Doa was talking to me, Doa, the you know the commentator. He was showing me some of the deck lists that the guys were playing. I was like, dude, we were playing this, like, a month ago. Like, where's, where's all your updated tech that everyone's <laughs> playing with? It seems like you just get destroyed if you play it, uh, those kinds of decks now. Of course, it could be one of those things where OGN required them to submit weeks ago. And as a result, they submitted old decks and they're playing with it. But uh, if he's able to bring updated lists, I mean, the Koreans show that execution. I mean, sometimes they can just play the same exact thing and do the, do the right plays as well. Yeah, I think a big part of it is just the amount of broadcasting you see. Mm -hmm. When you don't have as much of it, you're going to see less overall talent. Because again, it's like, okay. I mean, there's a lot of, like, as you said, there's a lot of fantastic right. play, but just not enough broadcast. Okay, now what's important is not just what Tang brings, but his opponent, Raynad. Uh, how are we feeling about his chances overall in this series? I know Raynan will probably generalize and throw, say, it's a 50-50, you know, any excuse that he'd rather just flip coins or do rock, paper, scissors. But realistically, <laughs> what are we, what are we pulling in terms of percentage of predictions here? Well, frankly, I think it is pretty close to 50-50. That's sort of the nature of card games. Now, where you get that edge is typically going to be in deck building. You know, everything else aside from that, it's just, I mean, the cards can fall any way. So given the fact that he's just been traveling so much, 
Hmm. I imagine Tang has probably had a little bit more time to prepare for this matchup, and so okay. I would tend... And this is not knowing the deck list by any means yet. I'm assuming hmm. you have some insight into Rain Ads. Um, I'm all right. But I don't, I don't really know anything about about Tang. I, I'm pretty sure I've casted him once before, but it was some small event. I just don't remember it very well. But I, in terms of deck building, I would tend to give the edge, I think, to Tang simply because he's had the time to prepare for it. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm thinking, like, looking at... Without unknown it actually feels like Reynat is going to be... I think he's going to be playing better as, you know, he's not going to be as nervous. He's had, you know, more experience with this sort of thing. But if, if they bring the same decks, I'd say I'd give the Reynat the edge, but I, I would think that, you know, Tang has had more time to prepare and I would be bringing the stronger decks. So I'd give it about 50 50 if, if, if the decks went that way, I'd say. Yeah. So you're not picking a player, you're just. I, I think this is the analysis I, corner where you're not allowed to have no opinion. Mm -hmm. you're forced I, 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 to think, I think slide that to Tang, maybe. Um, wow, everyone's doubting the Ray Bay. All right, well, you know what? <laughs> I guess in this case, I'm going to have to pick. The Salt King, man. I'm just going to oh, say yeah. Reynad is at his best when he makes around five to seven excuses on average prior to a match, and he gave me about five <laughs> of them. So it's usually the right around number because then he wins and he has no explanation other than say that he played well, but he refuses to admit it because then it becomes this thing where he builds up expectation. <laughs> so I think, uh, I think Reynad's got this. Picking your boss is a bold move. <laughs> <laughs> I just pinged him for one. Don't worry. I'm not, I'm not 100 just yet. So that wraps up our pregame analysis. Uh, we're going to give it over to our casters and see what they have to think. Thank you so much, guys. This is Nimsh and Aqua Blood. And uh, what a match ahead of us. Tying versus Reynad. Let's look at the deck list. Like, Reynad brought Hunter, Warlock, and Mage. Yeah, um, we know uh, Reynad for playing the zoo. He's um, very popular for playing Zoo. Uh, mage, he played some interesting mages recently, actually. He played that Echoes of Medivh kind of value mage. Him and Garrow played it in a tournament. I can't quite remember which one it was. And we have Hunter, so we, that could be anything. That could be mid-Hunter, face hunter But the player to talk about is Tang, really. We don't know anything about him or what he's playing. What do you think he's going to bring from like the Korean scene? Well, so for, for we know that he is bringing Paladin and uh, Warrior Mage, if I'm not mistaken. So like again, I'm, I'm really excited to see Tang play because I, I got some info from the Korean side of the stage, and he's not that known. Like He is the, the, the surprise factor. So he came here to Europe from Korea, bringing his own brews. And um, when I'm think, uh, thinking about Korean players, I'm thinking about Kranish bringing his own specific decks, like the Combo Warrior um, for, for BlizzCon. So right now, I expect anything from Tying. Like, Warrior can be the um, co like combo green patron deck, right? Like, Paladin, well, there's not that much wiggle room in pa Paladin, but still, he can bring his own uh, twist to the deck. And the last deck, Mage, that can be anything. No, oh, that'd be, yeah, like you said, Mage can be anything. Mage is one of those classes right now which has access to so many different types of decks. But the Paladin could surprise us. I mean, Savica's been playing with a, a more aggressive Paladin recently, and that's been uh, doing, it, doing really well for him for some reason. <laughs> the Hobgoblin Paladin. Yeah. Actually, it worked for him, kind of, right? Like, for some time it worked, but then um, he actually... Did he, did he lose with that, part, with that deck? I can't quite remember, but it, I, I, he did upset someone. I think it was in uh, Kingwin Pro League with... I think it was Frezer, actually. He beat Fresno with that in his lineup. But speaking of Korea, Korea is like start to make it splash on the Western world with Kranich and uh, Rene Hour both being picked up by big esports teams. SK Gaming for Rene Hour and Dignitas for, Kran uh, for Kranich. So they, they're now to start to move into the Western world and the Western Hearthstone scene with these big esports sign ins. And now Tyg is standing in front of Reyna. If he defeats Reyna, that's you know, one of the most recognized heads of Hearthstone being cut. And, um, but on the other hand, he had to travel here uh, from Korea, and Reynad stayed in Europe. Like Normally, I would say Reynad had to travel the distance from US, uh, Tang had to travel the distance from Asia, but now Reynad didn't have to travel that much. Yeah, fatigue is definitely something that can be taken into account with these big tournaments. Players traveling from all around the world, 20-hour flights and whatnot. And they do, they do take their toll, you know, especially if you can't, like, not, don't sleep very well on a plane, for example, or something. So maybe that might be a factor. Or maybe, maybe Tang just doesn't care. He's fine. He's, he's well-rested. He's, he's had a day. So uh, maybe that won't affect him. Oh, yeah, that's, that's really um, interesting to see. Also, like, Reynad is really experienced with tournaments, so he played many tournaments before. He is sitting in his comfort zone. In that seat, he, he was there 
I don't even know how many times, but more than 20 for sure. Yeah, off, all this experience from tournaments offline and online does really pay off in the long run, especially when you start playing in these events where you have players who have qualified, who have just like started coming onto the big stage. Um, these players like Reynard, who have a lot of experience in this, do have a bit of an edge sometimes because their confidence is uh, going to be high. They're not going to be as nervous, whereas the other player, for example, he's got the whole world watching him as a big spotlight on him. And this match will most likely mean a lot more to him because if he does beat this pro player, um, people will be asking questions. Who is this guy? Like, he, he did this, he's done that. So yeah, I think uh, Tang, you know, he's got, he can prove himself in this match. Also, the winner of this match is going to face Life Coach. So if Tang wins versus Reyna, wins versus Life Coach, and gets into top eight, that will be a baptism for fire for him. Wow, yeah, that'll definitely show that the Korean scene is definitely picking up. And, you know, that could bring a very promising future for Tang. You know, we might see him elsewhere if he starts taking down these, like, giants of Hearthstone. But on the other hand, Reynard has an edge. Like, he is in Europe, and he was in Europe before. He has, he has experience. And with his lineups, Hunter, Warlock, and Mage, I think that Warlock can actually be a zoo. Like, Reynard is the original creator of the of the zoo deck like there was warlock um aggro before but the zoo is reynad so right now who is the the best player who the best creator to actually in in innovate and you know and bring a new zoo breed to the fold well this is it zoo is his deck and zoo is just really picked up since St. gang boss has come around i mean lad has been swarming with zoo so it definitely puts reynad back in his comfort zone with this deck so he's probably very confident with this warlock deck as for Hunter and Mage, the Mage could be really be anything. I mean, Mech Mage is another deck a bit like Zoo in a way. It's very aggressive, fights for board a lot. Um, but also, we, like I said earlier, we had that Echoes Mage. So it's going to be very interesting what he brings. But we're going into the game now, and Tang has got his Paladin, and that's two loot hoarders. In the Paladin. The Paladin is... Uh, oh, no, it's the bottom one. Yeah, Sorry, the Paladin yeah. is the Juggler, Shield and Minibot, Quartermaster, Cockhammer, and an incredible start. Coin one of those. And then follow up with Juggler, Cockhammer. I think you can mulligan away Quartermaster, but other than that, it looks amazing. So, what? It looks like Freeze Mage. If Freeze I'm looking Mage. at Double Loot Hoarder, I'm thinking Freeze Mage. Oh, we need to see these cards. I want to know what deck he's running. But looking at Tang's hand, you know, um, like you say, probably throw away the Quartermaster. Everything else looks pretty decent. You want, like, what's the card you want uh, instead of a Quartermaster? Master for Battle. Master for Battle would be excellent. Synergize that Knife Juggler. Um, you don't really want a true sylph, you've got the cog hammer now to play with. So maybe like a pile to treader, something to help his curve out a little bit more. Um, as for Aenad, we don't really know what he's running yet because we haven't seen the rest of the mulligan come through. So we can't really make a judgment on what he needs. But we do. Wait, we're going to see an Ice Lance come off the top there. So it's most certainly going to be Freeze Mage, I imagine. Oh, yeah, that's definitely Freeze Mage from Reynard. Um now I'm curious which version of Freeze Mage because we talk like we see double with quarters. I would believe this is the, the standard cookie cutter. Uh, maybe there is a Tori Sun, no Molygos, just a standard build, which is really good. And uh, now I have to ask you, like, what's the matchup? Like, who has an edge here? Paladin? Uh, like, look in this hand, Paladin got everything. He even got the master for battle. But then overall, without like not looking at the hand, who has an edge in the matchup? Paladin or Freeze Mage? And very uh, overall, if. If Reynard draws a lot of his uh, board clear, a lot of his board removal, I think he'll probably go in Reynard's favor. Unless Tang is drawing stuff like uh, lay on hands, anti anti kill bar, waiting for that Alex Raza to come down, and then just spam and heal on himself to get him quite healthy. But even then, a mage can still have enough burst in their hand to deal with a lot of healing. So it'll very much come down to the kind of like the key cards in each deck, which will kind of decide uh, where this matchup is going to go. I certainly agree with that. Uh, and the key cards for Paladin are Lothab and Lay on Hands. By the way, it is really interesting that uh, Tang didn't coin out Shielded Minibot. He doesn't know which mage is this. He still doesn't know which mage it is, because it can be a mech mage. A mech mage missing at one drop, playing Mad Scientist in two. When he sees with Hoarder, he might still not know which mage is that. Well, that's the beauty of Mage right now. It utilizes the Mad Scientist in most of its variations. And from turn two, just seeing a Scientist, this could be Freeze, Tempo, Mech. Like, it could be anything, really. So, um, yeah, he's going to need to gain a bit more information, I think, through this game before he can decide. So this, this sequence will probably reveal a little bit more. If it's an Ice Barrier, but if it's an Ice Block, he's still a 
doesn't know what's going on as well, far as his deck. Right now he still doesn't know which secret it is, so do you play around Mirror Entity? You might actually have to. That's a nice barrier. So that's alright, I guess. Like He will want to draw into the Iceberg at some point, but having a nice barrier early can prolong the game, uh, will buy him some time. But for Tang, the decision is like, alright, I haven't seen Cog Master. I've seen Mad Scientist, and there is a secret now. I know Mech Mage is really popular. And it's Raynard playing as well. Uh, he, he favors the zoo deck, and Mech Mage has some f f some similarities, so he must be thinking, like, maybe this is Mech Mage. Mm. You know? Can I risk giving him a knife juggler, or can I risk giving him an Aldo, for example? So he's got to decide uh, where to go from here, but he needs to play something. I, I think the play is actually, well, the best play, knowing that this is a nice barrier, is juggler and then well, you probably don't lose the coin. Quickly. He might just go with the juggler here. So he's going to test his secret, I imagine, unless he decides to coin out the true silver. Oh, and he just goes for the muster for battle. So this is actually a very safe way to test this secret because he doesn't give a minion through the uh, mirror entity, and he can test for a nice barrier at the same time. Now he knows everything as well. Like, exactly. he knows it's freeze mage. It's just the moment of clarity is upon him. And that's a good draw for Reynard there. Only one power minions on the board. And he decides to go for the clear. I guess he's afraid of that coin and that quartermaster. He doesn't want him building a couple of free free straight away off the bat. Especially because he doesn't have a clear. He doesn't have Blizzard or a Nova um, Doomsayer. If, if there would be a quartermaster, that would be troublesome. But there is the Pine of the Shredder, which is an amazing card as well. And Reynard doesn't really have much removal. Like, he has draw. He has lots of draw. Three cards is going to provide him cards, but then... Oh, I mean, he has 16 armor of sustain there with the double ice barrier. I mean, we've seen one armor chip away, but that's quite a, that's a bulky bit of health to keep him going. And with the Acolyte of Pain and the Arcane Intellect in his hand, he does have car the card draw available to him. So he does have time. These ice barriers are really going to stall out things for this Paladin because they don't have a lot of burst. But mm -hmm. like you said, the Paladin Shredder is a good card here. It's going to stay on the board for quite a while. And like you said, Reynard doesn't have a way to deal with it. So he could get quite a bit of value out of this Shredder if he decides to play it. And he needs that value. Like the strategy for Paladin is just to get the damage early. Um, Move quickly. Get as much damage as possible in the face of your opponent before they stabilize, before mm -hmm. they set up an ice block, before they play Alex Raza. When they do it, you do want to use the key cards, but you do want to have in a position to win the game in one, two turns. And he still uh, creates a threatening board here for Quartermaster with those two 1-1s one remaining. So that must be playing on Reynard's mind now. Is it is a Quartermaster going to come down? I mean, again, six, he'll get six damage next turn off those two minions. Uh, Reynard can actually assess that uh, if there will be a Quartermaster, there was a coin. So Coin Quartermaster was a better play than Pilot Shredder. I believe it was. Because you still kill the loot hoarder and you have um, six power on board, you can That's attack. True. So we can assume that there's no Quartermaster, but then the Quartermaster can be top deck. I mean, he's pretty healthy right now. Uh, the Acolyte of Pain might be decent. Because he'll get one card from the Pain, and then potentially another card, unless he just wants to fully utilize it. But he draws a Doomsayer with double Fireball, but still nothing to keep the board at bay yet. He hasn't seen any Frost Novas, any Blizzards yet. So this is what he's probably fishing for. Yeah, you can play the Loot Hoarder again so that you could cycle it into a card and something has to trade into it. Well, like the weapon attack, let's say. You want more cards being freeze mage here. Just playing the Doomsayer is not an option because it's just going to die and you want to clear board of it. And you want to keep the Falnos for your burst. I, I don't think uh, Reynard's at the stage right now where he's that desperate for, um, for more card. I mean, he's got a loot holder, it does the same thing, so I don't think we're going to see that going away. But he decides to go for the pain. So that's a, that might mean he is a bit worried about the Quartermaster. Yeah, like instead of like playing with Horde and Dragon Art card, he hopes to top deck something. Well, he's not dead yet, and he's far from dying with the second Ice Bar in hand. And he will draw many cards anyway. He has the Acolyte of Pain next turn. So I believe like Paladin will just... Um, mm. It's tag, what do you do? Well, he's got Cogmaster. He can give a, a bit of protection to one of his minions from the inevitable board clear that follow, but I don't think he wanted that 1 1 to get it. Oh man, this is preventing the 1 1 from dying. So it's not that bad. Reynard can't ping it anymore. Well, if, if, if he was playing around Quartermaster, he's just got a, a 1 1 with Torn to Divine Shield that could be buff, so. There's an extra as a pickup for Reynard, but this turn might be just Ice Barrier and Aqua of Pain. Is there anything else you can see here? I think maybe. 
Ice Barrier Loot Hoarder. So the, you, could, you, you probably want to ping on his Acolyte of Pain. Let the pain but it does take away a bit of the damage here if you decide to use his Knife Chugger to clear this up. The thing is, like, this is more mana efficient. Like, you're still drawing one card from Acolyte of Pain and you spend three mana, so you can play Loot Hoarder, let's say, maybe next turn. Or, or like turn after that. And the one one trades pretty efficiently into the loot hoarder anyway, and it doesn't and it stays there with the taunt. Even a weapon attack. Or even a weapon attack, like you said, yeah. Let me but right, right now it's like tanking let's say this acolyte is tanking three points of damage and he still draws a card. But he's got that Alex Strasso sitting there waiting, he's only got a few turns till he can use it, and with two fireballs he just needs to draw a frostbolt or something and things will look really good for Reynad. He decides to use the four damage there from the shredder. Oh, there is a flame strike. That's the first clear he needs. Reynard looking pretty comfortable here. This is quite a tough turn, I think. I mean, he could just drop the Sylvanas just for some power on the board, but what's he considering here? I mean, the heals from the True Silver are not really going to make much of a difference until Alex has played. Well. I, f I like Black Knight because it's creating a body on board, which is a 4-5, uh, it's not going to die. Sylvanas is fine as well. But then with Sylvanas, Reynard can just play the Boomsayer and um, Fireball Sylvanas. We've seen this before. Using Sylvanas to give the Doomsayer to your opponent. Yeah, that's true, but he, he has just through a Frostbolt, so he has a considerable amount of burst in his hand. And with the Alex Raza sitting there as well, it's only a matter of time before Reynard gets to throw that Alex down and start throwing fireballs around. So Tang really needs to draw something here, like a heal, or he's going to be in a lot of trouble. Well, he has a True Silvers, so the first True Silver will offer eight points of damage, and the second True Silver can heal a bit when Alex Raza is basically getting dropped. And you know, you just need to escape the, the 15 health mark. If you attack one with Trusilver, you could get up to 17. And then Alex Traza, let's say, with reduced attack from Aldor, is not killing you. And you have one more turn to win. Yeah, that's true. And he decides to go with a Flame Strike there. Doesn't quite clear the board. He still has quite a few minions sitting around. Mm. But again, Ting didn't really draw anything that useful. The True Silver might come down here, but I think the Black Knight is probably the best now. You've just seen a Flame Strike. Chuck four or five body on the board. It might be a bit safe. Might get blizzard, but at least won't get, you, you won't be expecting a second flame strike if you've just seen one. The problem the paladin is uh, facing is not enough burst. Like you want to grind the mage down, but you weren't able to actually kill everything because right now is playing minions. And right now, right now being at 17, it's, it's looking pretty good. Even though he doesn't really have a way to clear the board and he doesn't top like anything here. Well. All right, uh, he actually has the play I mentioned before, like just stealing, giving the Doomsayer. And he didn't even have to use a Fireball this turn either, which is really good, so he keeps that burst in his hand. And he did draw another Ice Lance. So Falnas Frostbolt, Ice Lance, Ice Lance. Oh, and there's the Ice Block as well, wow. There's an Ice Block, but it's not, doesn't really matter that much. Yeah, Paladin's never going to be able to do that much damage, especially with no board, so we're not looking really comfortable here. He also used the True Silver to keep trying to chip away at him, but he's not going to get the heal when Alex Straza comes down. But we do see the other True Silver in hand, so something to consider. Oh, you can also, like, if you want to be super safe, you can go Antonai does Ice Block, but I don't think there's any for that. Alex Straza here, you know the True Silver just got used. You hope there's no heal bot or lay on hands. We do see a big game hunter in his hand. He has a way to deal with this, but... How much damage is there with, like, the Iceland's double Iceland's Falness? That's five. A lot. <laughs> so 6, 8, 10. This is uh, 5, 10, 14, 21 damage from uh, the whole thing. And he does get an opportunity to play the Ice Block next turn. No, like right now, wins right now. Just right now, does he? 21 points of damage from Falnus, Fireball, uh, oh, right, Frostbolt, yeah, Double yeah, Islands. All right, so Reyna is going to take game number one with his Freeze Mage, a pretty well-played game, uh, nicely executed. Paladin struggled. Uh, Tank wasn't able to develop the board enough to be able to push for damage, and he didn't have the heals. Like, he had the True Silver, but uh, 21 points of damage coming from Reyna on one turn with the Falnas, Double Iceland's Frostbolt Fireball combo. It was going to be a tough match for Tang anyway, just because of the matchup. And like you said, he didn't, he didn't, we were saying earlier that it was those key cards 
that will make a big difference in that matchup. And unfortunately, Tanged didn't draw any of them. He so. might not even play them. Well, he might he was surely playing them in hands, but he might not play the Lothab. Like Lothab is coming in and out of decks and uh because like there is um Torison now. So Torison people tend to play more greedy decks and uh, but on the other hand on, from Tyang's perspective, I didn't see that many greedy cards. Like he played the standard list. He had Black Knight, which is a conditional card. But then nothing really did surprise me. Maybe Kalkhammer and Black Knight is not traditional, but it's just the cards. Yeah, they're kind of like the optional picks you would. I mean, uh, would take in uh, Paladin because you've got like a few slots in there you can kind of switch up with things. So I wonder what he's predicting with that Black Knight. I mean, it's a card that kind of kind of dips in and out of favor very yeah. often. So um, he might have had a read on what people are playing. That's why he put in there. We, we just won't know. But we'll see that Paladin uh, list again. So we might see some other things come from it. So what do you think Raynan's going to pick next? Well, he has the Warlock and he has uh, the Hunter. Um, both decks are good, whatever version he has. And uh, I would expect Zoo from um, Warlock being a Zoo and Hunter being the face Hunter because those decks are super po uh, super powerful right now. But I would not be surprised if he is playing a Handlock or like a Demon Handlock, Handlock with Demons. But on the other hand, with Tang, um, I am really curious if Tang did his research, because, you know, like Tang is playing in Korea. I believe he's playing on the uh, on the Asian servers. And uh, the metagame might be a, a bit different. Like, we, we don't talk about it that much, because EU and NA are really similar with regards to what people play. But then the meta game on the Asian server might be a bit different. So if he is not like you know he qualified, he played really well. He he won versus those people, and he's here. And uh, maybe he studied his opponent a bit, but maybe he didn't, and he just brought the decks that feel good to him. And uh, he might be surprised by some some cards. Yeah, there's definitely a point to be made with the meta. I mean, look at the Chinese priest, for example, the one that run death loads and light bombs. I mean, that that came from China, so that deck must have been doing pretty well on the ladder, where we would never have seen that deck unless we had any knowledge of the Asian scene. So. It's more than likely that Tang has a lot more knowledge on our scene than Reyna might have on their scene because oh, yeah. our scene's so much in the in the spotlight with televised events and uh, and with pro players that uh, it's much easier to keep track of that. Whereas with the Asian scene, it's still developing, so you'd have to do kind of a lot of research yourself to to get that knowledge. So maybe that's that's Tang's advantage here is having. Honor. The, having the knowledge of our scene, whereas we might not have the knowledge as his. Oh yeah, definitely. The research is a very important part of Hearthstone. And the second game has started. We have Tang taking his Paladin again and Reynard getting the Face Hunter. And I can tell, because I play a lot of Face Hunter in my time. Yeah, I've played a lot of Face Hunter too. And that quick shot, a new card from Blackrock coming in into this hand. I mean, this did it, a lot of people have discussed this card within uh, my community as was it necessary for Hunter to have this card created? Quick shot. Yeah. Oh, obviously, yes. It was really necessary because, you know, at some point when you go for face with everything, you run out of cards. So you need something to draw, right? Right. Do they really need it, though? <laughs> That's the big question. I mean, one thing, quick shot, one thing interesting about quick shot is if Control Hunter ever came around, it might not be too bad in say like a control a control hunter deck because it's a bit like a dark bomb in a way but with a bit extra to it so you know i mean i don't think it's a, a card that just stays with face hunter i think it can be played Not elsewhere good. oh yeah definitely it's just a, a good removal card for hunter but then it fits in face hunter because you do empty your hand and you recharge it yeah so what do you think about the hand for uh for tank here for paladin it's looking a little it looks a bit clunky with the Dr. Boom, but the True Silver will help clear up the board. And the, the Consecrate, obviously, is um, very good for him, but he definitely wanted to see like Zombie Chows or Mini Bots, just something like straight away, something immediate on the board to just challenge it. This is all coming a bit later, and it might be a bit too late. You know what Face Hunters are like. Oh, there is Lothab. Um, so he did enjoy the Lothab last, uh, last game, which was a very important card. From my experience, this matchup is really good for Face Hunter. Um, it depends on a couple of cards from Paladin. Like if Paladin runs Sludge Belchers, Paladin runs uh, anti heal bot, and obviously uh, the openings with Zombie Child Shield and Minibot, as you mentioned. But if the, if you don't see those cards, Hunter has a great time. Like you have great time, great fun. You just go for phase. They try to build up a board to kill your minions. They unleash the hounds. Maybe you even get a juggler. 
and you just continue with your game plan uninterrupted, and they even help you to kill them. Yeah, and the thing with Paladin, in the mid-range variant, it can be kind of tweaked to face mid-hunter, maybe like put two zombie chows in, for example. But uh, mid-Paladin kind of, when you build it, you've got, it's got kind of have an agenda, I think, of what it wants to beat. If you wanted to beat decks like face hunter, for example, you do start need to put in these two zombie chows, but we haven't seen any yet, so I'm not sure, um, I don't think it's aimed in that direction yet, but we haven't seen enough cards. But like you said, it's just such a rough time for Paladin because you can just do what you want with Face Hunter. And the Owls especially, those Sludge Belchers might not even matter because of Owl. Oh yeah. Uh, on the other hand, I want to mention that Reynard's hand is really bad. Like he missed a one drop. His two drop was great, but then he basically missed... Um... All right, he has the Animal Companion, so it's not that terrible. And he oh yeah, he gets a Huffer. It improved immensely now. He just got like extra four damage, so yeah, it did improve a lot. Maybe you'll trade up here. Just oh yeah, you'll trade. Definitely. You want to protect your hammer. You want to force a weapon attack, or you want like there's not always consecration, but even if there is consecration, you're still happy about it. Yeah, it doesn't clear up hands. So yeah, he's um he's in a good spot here. I mean, oh, and we got some uh, challenger bra bracket update here. Airbrush beat Movitz. Both so, players from Sweden. So Movitz eliminated from the oh, tournament. Movitz a, a very nice player. He started playing competitively Hearthstone um, like a month ago. Was, yeah, he did say. And he co uh, he qualified for this tournament. Unfortunately, he's out, but um, we might see him in the future again. A uh, really nice guy. Playing some From what we were told, Airbrush is, uh, has a little bit of responsibility for Orange uh, playing Hearthstone quite competitively because they used to be Magic partners. So, uh, yeah, two good players there. But the explosive trap comes down. That's a bit. That's quite a good value for the explosive trap because it didn't really do much on the board. But I think Tang is a little bit behind here. That's the only problem. Tang is really behind. Uh, already lost ten points of health. He doesn't have any taunts. It's not like he can respond to whatever Reynard plays. Um, for Reynard, there is a couple of plays now. He can uh, play Hunter Creeper and Hero Power to use the Hero Power. He can also play Lepernome and the Eagle Hornbow to deal some extra damage. Basically, you want to empty your hand, so you have to think like, what do you do on turn five? Yeah, we're in. He's in a different situation because some some hunters, uh, especially face hunters, before quick shot came around, they wanted to utilize that hero power as much as possible because they would eventually just run out of steam, and the and the, the hero power um, help with that problem because it's, it's just too damage to the face, and that's your agenda anyway. But now quick shots about like you might want to just empty your hand to, to cycle through. I mean, if you play quick shot on a later turn, you might get like a wolf right there, and that's three damage again, for example, and then all of a sudden you've got. Six damage, so it's, it's a very powerful card in Face Hunter. Oh, yeah. And now this Lothab is actually not doing anything. It's just a 5-5 five, five body that's going to trade into the small minions, not doing much damage, not doing much board presence. And uh, Reyna can just continue going to face. I mean, he's seen the Consecrate here. This is probably why he chose to play the Wolf Rider over, say, the Bow. It's because he just develops more of a board there, more trouble for the low, the low feb and the paladin, and then he has that kind of more immediate, out of the blue, like, oh, I've got an eagle hornbow as well, by the way, and yeah, I think this is good to play in the wolf rider. I also like how he play Lepernome instead of hero powering because you do have to think like, all okay, right, hero power is uh, granting me a card, kind of because I don't have to play a card, I can play later, but then it grants me two points of damage, and Lepernome is giving mm. me for one mana a bit more, like maybe four, maybe six, even if there is no. Uh, Reply to the Lepernome. So for Tang now, what do you do? Like you, you face those those leper nimshes and uh, you know wolf riders. He's just in such a tough spot. He can't. He couldn't even Aldor and play True Silver, which is really rough. I mean, he could have reduced some of the damage he'd take from training his uh, True Silver into one of these minions, but he, he's just out of time, I think. And this is what Face Hunter does. It just, just overwhelms you, especially a deck like Paladin. He needs taunts. He needs the heals. And then he needs more taunts, more, more heals, and uh, after that, find a way oh, to quickly. win the game with damage. Right now he's just defending, and uh, defending is not the best course of action against the Hunter. No, we're looking at Reyna's hand Let here. He's got a kill command, see. quick shot, eagle hornbow. He even has an owl, the silence here, Belcher, but also an activator for the kill command. So he's not even worried about that. He still has a kill command that can do five, and another leopard. Oh, so. yes! <laughs> so another two damage sitting there that will eventually go off. It's, it's just looking really bleak for Tang here. Is Reynard going to win this game on the back of his double Leopard Nymph? Possibly. He could. he could. I mean, he has a lot of 
burst potential this turn, if you please, is he's got five from the kill command, three from the eco horn bow, and what he's got on board, but he decides to just take the two damage from the leopard, clean up the, uh, clean up the low pep there. What's crazy is that on turn seven, if there is a slot belcher, Raynard can just sign as the belcher, play kill command for five damage, and then play a quick shot and even... Seven damage. Yeah, that's seven damage out of nowhere. And he has the weapon, so he possibly has ten points of damage. Uninterrupted. Ten points of damage happening next turn. Whatever happens, even if the board is cleared, I don't see a way from ta for tying to... He needed something off the top there. Even a, bel a belch wouldn't have made a difference. He would have needed, say, an antique heal bot just to stay in the game, but unfortunately he uh, didn't get one, Let so... You know what he needed, really? He needed the previous hand from the freeze mate game. Yeah, that would have been very good. He had a lot of early game pressure there. He could have uh, fought the board at least, but unfortunately this is not going to be enough, and Raynan's going to take this game. On the back of his Lepernoom, Reynard taking game number two, getting a 2 0 lead versus Tying from Korea. Who is going to face Life Coach? Who is going to play versus Bunny Muffin? Is it Bunny Muffin or Bunny Muffin? I don't know. Bunny Muffin, as far as I know. And so Reynard's got his Warlock left. And we haven't seen any of the other decks from Tang. I would like to see maybe his main check, just to see what it is. Do you think that Tang is actually losing on purpose to conceal his other decks? to get an edge against his next opponent? Perhaps, I mean, that is a that is a legitimate strategy, I suppose. If, he's, if he picks Paladin now and he wins, that's great. You know, he can carry on and maybe win the series. But if he loses, he doesn't show anything else. And uh, he's got a bit more surprises in store for his next opponent. All right, that was an excellent reply to my joke. <laughs> <laughs> so Paladin, one of the decks that uh, actually can lose 0-3. Like, I've seen Paladin losing 0-3. And um, it's a deck that often kills itself. Like, you get those clunky draws. And we've seen this game versus Reynard. Like, Reynard, uh, he missed the one draw, but then he was able to follow up with standard cards because Face Hunter, like every card supports the strategy. Every card is actually a good card you draw. And for Paladin, he got a really clunky hand. Do you think he just continues with the Paladin now? And Because he has to win one I game? I think so. I think you just use the Paladin. Don't reveal any information to your other opponents um, if you do lose this game. You, obviously, you play to win. You obviously don't play to lose here, but it's definitely a, a strategy. It's like a backup strategy. Uh, if I lose this game, no one else is what I'm playing yet, so at least I've got that surprise factor. And I've seen it. I've actually seen it done. I've seen it done against me, actually. Um, some players, a, a player in Green Sheep actually just used Mech Mage against me for the whole thing in one tournament because he didn't want to reveal anything else to me, and I had no idea what else he had for the rest of the tournament, so I think it's a, a viable strategy. Did he win in the end, or did you win in the end? I won. I won. Fine. You won in the end. All right. All right, we'll never know what Green Sheep played in that tournament, but now Reynard is playing... Oh, my God. What was that? What, what's this Warlock? Did we just see Doomguys? I haven't seen anything. I just I think we just saw Doomguys. <laughs> So this is a zoo. Oh, it's not a zoo. It is a zoo. It could still be a zoo. It's, it's got a knife juggler. It's Reynat Zoo. Sunat. That very old school tactic of void, uh, void terror, because there's so many voids now. Void terror eating the, uh, the Nerubian eggs and such, or power overwhelming dominions. Maybe that's what he's going for here. Void terror is such a fun card. But still, uh, Tang. Looking at this uh, juggler, uh, probably sigh of relief. Like facing handlock in this situation would be terrible for him, but facing Zoo and having the shield and mini bot, at least he knows that he can do something. Oh, Reynard's expression there when he drew the other Doom guy did not look pleased with that. Yeah, that's a standard Reynard draw. Everybody knows that Reynard is an unlucky player. I mean, he's, I think he's pretty happy here with the dagger hit and the shield and mini bot, but we do see the cock hammer in his hand, so it may not make that much difference. Oh, and our shield and mini bot. But then there is the cock hammer, as you said. Interesting. True silver will be important. Like from my experience, this matchup, uh, from Paladin's perspective, is that you need to get consecration at some point. Like if you don't get a consecration, Zoo will overrun mm. you. Like you are going to kill those minions, but they pump so many minions at the same time. They draw cards, so you like they can tap also because you spend all your resources to just cut the board. And, and all of a sudden, two more cards come down. Yeah, all right. the time, all the time. You need like a big consecration, uh, maybe with equality, maybe without equality, just to get that edge. So they, the board is clear and they have a reset around like turn six or seven. You're like, all right, the board is reset, and now I can play my Tyrion into quite an empty board and then go from there. 
And then it's harder for Zoo to deal with that once you've cleared a lot of their board and they're just tapping for things. Because they, they can still draw stuff like one drops and two drops. And when you slam that Tyrion, like you said, after that big board clear, it could be a nightmare for Zoo to deal with right now. Oh, and Ruben Egg top deck for uh, for Reynad. So he will be able to get something from that Void Terror. And this turn is not terrible as well. Like, even though Tank had a really good start with that uh, Cog Hammer and um, that, that Shield Amiibo, Reynad is able to just attack into the 2-2, get a token, get Implosion. He's I definitely won. scared of Consecration. But if there is no Consecration, he gets an Edge. <laughs> implosion is... free. Almost four. Almost four. Yeah, he got, he got the extra guy from the Gamba, so you could call it four. I mean, he doesn't draw the Consecration either, but even then, like you said, is it? he might need to Consecrate a board like this, but it's not the best Consecration you can have. You want him to have some more high-value targets there, like Knife Jugglers, for example. I mean, he's just killing tokens at that point. Um, but he gets the uh, well, five those, now. Those tokens are still dealing damage, and, uh, and it's not like Father can do much about them. But we do see the heal bot actually, which we were talking about in the freeze mage game. So he does run low five and heal bot, and well, we have to see a lane on hands. I can't remember. Not yet. No, we haven't. So it seems like the freeze mage game. He got really unlucky with the draws. Yeah. So this is a tough turn. Uh, I like. I snap play Nerubin Egg and Voitara. I, I just need to think about the order, how to do it. I Especially because I haven't seen consecration. I don't think. Do you take an imp with you as well? Just um, to make a bulkier. What does Voitara? it change? You are going to have four attack and one more health, six health. I mean, if he was worried, I guess he's not worried about concentrating. So he's happy to have the more one one. So just more stuff for the paladin to deal with, and he can use him to trade in here. Yeah, that seems pretty good. So Zoo is doing its thing right now, but the one issue that could uh, come up for Reynard soon is he does have double Doom God Sylvanas in his hand. Well, I guess you just uh, try to empty your hand and um, you play Sylvanas. Well, right now it's really important what Tank is going to do because he can coin his own Sylvanas into this board. And uh, and I think that's the play. Like Sylvanas is one of the cards that will help you come back into the I game. No time but for still... There would be no good way to kill his Sylvanas right now. Like, you want to attack into something, and then you want to lose your Sylvanas to steal something. Oh, no wow. boom! That's a very interesting card in a kind of like Zoo deck, right? I've actually seen it cropping up in Zoo a lot more these days. Um, I think one of uh, an, an NA player on Legend was starting to run kind of like a, almost like a mid rangey zoo. So like Shredders and Dr. Boom, Sylvanas, just kind of taking a more later game approach with Zoo rather than the, the really aggressive one which we're quite used to. But yeah, Dr. Boom is going to play a, a big role in this match, I think. Do you... What, what can you do here? Do you quality here? With well, equality, you can steal Sylvanas. It might be worth it here, yeah. Because you call you then choose silver something and then you attack with your Sylvanas into the second minion and you steal Sylvanas. And that might also be the way to counter Dr. Boom. Let me because if you do... You can't attack Sylvanas and Sylvanas because the problem will just uh, get the minion back. Yeah, this is looking like the play he's going for. I think it's a very good one. And like you said, it does help him deal with the Dr. Boom come next turn. Uh, well, he's probably not expecting it, to be honest. But um, at least the Sylvanas will have an opportunity uh, to steal something and just help him sustain a little bit more. But oh, there's the owl. Oh, the, but, but the owl will actually make the Sylvanas back to 5-5. Five five. Yeah, that might be not worth doing, to be honest. And also, if you if you owl Sylvanas now, you'll have to play Doomguard, I believe. Like, you can't play Boom. If you play Boom, you, you, you lose Boom because he just attacks with the weapon. Oh, actually, there is a small chance that the bomb will kill Sylvanas and the Sylvanas will kill the bomb, but I'm not sure if you can take this risk. Such an awkward situation for, for Reynard right now. Maybe do, may, do, you, do you tap? Like, you have time. I mean, he's at 28 health. He taps, he goes down to 26. Paladin's not going to burst you down out of nowhere. So it might give him an opportunity to... Uh, just play a smaller minion, which Sylvanas might feel a bit desperate to get rid of, and then uh, he has a safer Doctor Boom to follow up. But he needs to, he needs to. It's very uh, high risk playing this Doctor Boom right now. I think I like the tap because if you, 
got a minion he can play. Not very interesting minion, but... Uh, oh, he's, he's going for Doomguard. If he goes for Iron Beak now, Silence is Sylvanas, he can definitely... He can even play the Abusive Surgeon, and next turn he can play Boom, and he knows that next turn there is no Tyrion, the Tyrion will come after Boom, if there is a Tyrion. If he goes for Doomguard, there is a chance that he will not... Like, Doomguard will get stolen by Savannah, so it's not doing anything. So I think that was a great play. What do you think no about not playing the Abusive Surgeon? I think he should have played it, because he needed the True Silver. He needed Sylvanas to hit something, I think. But I think Let Tank can actually see. come back here. Probably He's got an anti-kill, but he's got the heal. He's got a Quartermaster, so he can start to generate some tokens. And then he's got a Tyrion, so he's got a lot of the late-game stuff. And the problem with Raynan's kind of late-game here is that he may end up discarding one piece of it, so... Yeah, it's interesting. I think double, double Doomguard is actually Raynan's signature mm. move. <laughs> I heard him talking about it a lot. Signature double Doomguard, yeah. That's not, that's not what you want to have as your signature move as a zoo player, really. Oh, he played Quartermaster before making a token. That's a very interesting play. That was a mistake. Yeah, that, that was... A... Mistakes were made. They were... Oh, man. The first time in competitive... <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm just speechless. Well, okay, I can only say that this is stress. Like, and I think he actually wanted to play uh, anti kill. <laughs> so oh, you think you think he misclicked the actual? Yeah, card? I think he actually misclicked the card um, because anti kill was definitely a valid play here, and he wanted to play anti kill. He just took quartermaster. Okay. Well, so can, I don't think he's out of the game just yet. I mean, he just got his own Doctor Boom, and he can clear up this Doctor Boom with Sylvanas and the and the quartermaster. Get rid of a. a a bomb as well and just play his own Doctor Boom and he's not in any threat. Oh yeah, certainly. He's, he's actually in good position. He still has the anti-kill bot that he didn't play. But uh, I have to say, like, this was the most awkward moment I've seen in the competitive play ever. Or oh, play, <laughs> what? <laughs> Picking the wrong card, yeah. It's, it's pretty rough. I mean, especially with so many viewers as well. Um, I mean, he's got, he's got to look past it now, not let it affect his confidence and just think, all right, it happens, mistakes happen, just carry on playing, I'm in, I'm in a good position. Yeah. Oh man, he's taking the gamble here. Uh, he is going for the boom and he will go for a bomb. And then if bomb hit, hits face, Doomguard is possible 7 damage from a Beauty Surgeon. Is he going for the other boom? Yeah. All right, so Reynard not there yet, but it's definitely getting close. This was his turn, but he's not going to, to seal the game right now. Uh, and then we will have Tyrion and the Healbot, so it seems that Tang is actually climbing back. And think how crazy it will be if Tang actually wins the game where he plays Quartermaster and then um, Rainforest. Maybe this is just some high-level BM we've never witnessed before. This is Maybe this is... High level Korean BM. He's just like, oh, I'll make a mistake on purpose. Like, look, look at Reynard right now. Reynard is thinking, am I actually losing to, to a person who played Quartermaster and then use hero power? The thing is, if you look at Reynard's hand here, um, a lot of the targets that could be discarded from Doomguard are very low value now. I mean, you could potentially risk it if you want, but I think, or you could even tap first and maybe draw another one drop, two drop. But yeah, he seems a bit puzzled about what to do here. Maybe Reyna is waiting till turn 10 when he can play double Doomguard. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, mean, I guess he's playing... Okay, so he values his, this Voidwalker. Uh, and there is the first Doomguard discarding Doomguard. So... So Reyna has actually lost two Doomguards now. I got the Boom and the Sylvanas. Yeah. Surely that is all the late game threat he has. <laughs> well, he can still have power overwhelming, and I'm sure he's running too, because he was having Void Terror and... Yeah. So he still has some burst, and... Uh, but then again, he is losing this board. How do you clear this board and stay alive? I think True Silver and an anti killbot is definitely very decent. Let I mean, he can get rid of the Doomguard there, still keep his um, Dr. Boom alive with one health, which is fine, because it's done its job, then it's help. Uh, help you uh, live another turn, and then after that, he's just got Tyrion coming down, and Reynard's tapping. Can you somehow um, protect uh, the boom? Oh, he's just going for Tyrion. I guess why not? Let me think. If there is an Iron Big Owl. I mean, he needed to like, draw Iron Big Owl, then tap into Power Overwhelming to win, 
right? Which is actually possible. So that's why I favor True Silver and Anti Key. If he runs two IMB cows, that is, he may only run one. I mean, he's got Sylvanas in there and he's got Doctor Boom. Like, where are these slots? What is he, what's he taking out for these things? You know what I really like? I like Doctor Boom going for face here. So you kill the the, the Void Walker with the weapon. You play the heal bot and you go for face for eight. Oh, so you put him on the clock then. He's yeah. tapping. He's trying to. He's trying to make a comeback from just tapping. Oh, there's the overwhelming. Oh, there's no out. Oh, that's a flame. You never want to see flame when you're behind. Right up behind on board with the power of warming. Man, this consecration is gonna slam down. Probably play the Black Knight as well for more board. I actually like Syria here, but that is fine still. Like he's building up his board. And Tyrion's most certainly gonna close out the game here. I think next yeah. turn if he can't. Tag is playing super safe, and uh, it's for now it's paying off. Like he. Sealed the game, I think. Like Reyna is in a very bad spot. There is a void. So Reyna just concedes. He doesn't see a way out here. And Tang's actually gonna see that Paladin take a win. So the Paladin's done its job. Maybe this Druid and Mage could be the one, but Zoo is just one of those decks that can just snowball out of control so quickly and so early. Especially if you've got nothing in your hand that can respond to it, becoming a developing such a huge board early on. I'm really curious to see like how the zoo uh, works exactly because we've seen a couple of builds and uh, we've seen Orange, I believe, playing the the Sea Giant Zoo uh, because uh, like uh, right now we got Gang Boss and people are experimenting with it. So Sea Giant is one route you can take, and right now it's taking another one with the Void Terrors and, uh, and the Power of Rumbling. So, so um, I've, I I really wonder how this deck does versus Warrior because Warrior Zoo is a good matchup for Zoo originally. And uh, even though Implosion is not a great card versus Warrior, you still have a lot of Defrado cards, you have the Doom guards, you can push the board. And, um, and Warrior struggles at some point, like, because there's so many waves of minions, you can brawl only once. And uh, you, know, you, you, you don't try to re remove on a key moment, and you're dead. Exactly, yeah. But, um, but I don't, well, that's not going to really be a problem for Tang, though, because he's got Druid and Mage left. But anyway, we're going to take it to a quick break. We'll be back with the rest of this game. It's 2-1 uh, to Reynad, so we'll be back very shortly. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Hearthstone Chiffinity Spring Masters 2. I am Nimsh, and I'm joined by Aquablood. We're casting Reynad versus Tang. Reynad is actually leading the, the match 2-1, to one, but Tang took the first game for himself with his Paladin deck. Yeah, and he also... Uh Made a little bit of a mistake, which we were all a bit confused about at first, but I think he was so far ahead at that point that it didn't matter. He managed to keep his cool, keep his composure, and uh, seal that game. But now we have his two other decks, which we have no idea what they are yet. We just know the Druid and Mage. So we'll be interested to see what Korea brings to the table with these two classes. Well, I assume it can be something really surprising, but... I'm leaning more into the cookie cutters. Yeah, we're probably going to see a faster. The mage is probably the big question mark because mage has a lot of viable decks right now. Mech mage, tempo mage, freeze mage. So that's going to be the big, the interesting deck um, from Tang's lineup. So I'd like to see that next, to be honest. <laughs> so the big question is, how much salt will Reynard produce if he loses this match? Well, wow, as we were discussing, this is this is Reynard's deck. This is his signature deck, what he's famous for. If he was to lose now with Zoo to Tang, uh, he would have lost three games of it in a row. That would that would be tough. Oh, and you could put down the first you game definitely to the it. double Doom Guard in his hand, but he still managed to do all right. So we'll have to see. I think we're going into the next game right now. Oh man, the Mech Mage has been dropped. Ah, so nothing too exciting, but you never know. There's been quite a few variations. Oh, of come Mech on! Mage. It's a very exciting deck. You just play the minions and they interact with each other. Like Cog Master, for example, he can fake he can fix everything. That's true, and this is what we want from Halso, isn't it? Minion interaction, board interaction. So this hand is looking this hand's looking all right. He's got a. Um, it looks just, perfect. He has the coin. He has Met Scientist. And now he got Shur as well. Like the only card I would switch here, maybe having a spider tank. I don't know. Just how many draws straight back into that goblin blast mage? And he's got the mechs to back it up. But before in his mulligan, he only had the one mech sitting there. 
And this deck, in the past, I've seen suffers from the, the goblins and gnomes syndrome, where it just draws lots of goblins, lots of gnomes, no mechs, and he's not going to have that problem just yet. What to do? Well, he does that mad scientist, so it's looking good uh, for the opening hand for Reynard. Speaking of clunky hands. <laughs> well, he does have a two drop and a three drop, come on. Yeah, but we still see Sylvanas and Doomguard. He probably wants something else, something a bit better than that. But this is Zoo. This is a Zoo variation, so it's very easy for this deck to find its curve with its hero power and uh, by just drawing into the lower stuff. But we still have a, a few things to see from Reynard's deck. Yeah, you might have some more interesting cows in there. Like double Doomguard. Like double Doomguard. <laughs> A very interesting play by Reynard here. If uh, Tang actually misclicks an attack into the Nerubian Egg, it will produce a 4-4. <laughs> it will indeed. So what would you play here? Do you want the science to start setting up that, the Mirror Entity uh, shenanigans, or do you want to get some more mechs down? I like Scientist, uh, because even if you don't feel like you're going to use the Mirror Entity, because it's your playing versus Zoo, so you can get something small like uh, Haunted Creeper mm. or or a flame him. Actually, those cards are still good. But uh, you want to filter your deck. Like, you don't want to draw into that mirror entity. You want to get something else. And this uh, this snow chug will be quite useful next turn if he doesn't say draw a spider tank, because it, it does still potentially set up that blast mage for the next turn if you want to. But then the ruby next is going to create some trouble for Whoa. that. Whoa. A Meg Warper. Come on. Tang's drawing what he needs here. So he gets two mechs instead of one. Tang is an excellent mech mage player. I'm I mean, He's probably one of the best mech mage players I've ever seen, to be honest. Like, I, I never draw this stuff. <laughs> I'm always really fighting like, to get my board uh, it's also developed. It's also so important because he will be able to play Blast Mage, and uh, he will certainly have a mech. Right now, he can just close his eyes and go for phase. Like, is there any way to trade in the deck? Gang boss? I wouldn't bother unless you can take him out in one clean hit. Because you're just developing more problems for your mech, so you want to keep these mechs alive as much as possible, so just go and face here. It's probably the best option. But then there is Defender Vargas for Reynard, and then Nerubian Egg will start kicking and biting, maybe even hatch at some point. So this is the exact board state where we can see the power of Imp Gangabaus, like, you know, being a big minion and spawning those 1-1s. One the thing is, the Nerubian Egg now, it's been activated by Argus, is going to pop eventually. So it does make the Blast Mage a little bit better because he doesn't have the randomness of it hitting, say, the Egg when it was at two and spawning it. Because now it's activated anyway, so unless he can silence it, which Mech Mage generally don't run, he's going to have to deal with it eventually. So maybe Blast Mage is good here and he can clear up the uh, Ink Camp boss with the Cogmaster. Yeah, you attack first and then you play Blast Mage. So he's got, he's got a good turn here. Still, um, Zoo is fighting back. Like, Reyna build up a board. Um, right now, what Mech Mage is forced to trade. To so eventually, Zoo can actually overpower Mech Mage, even though Reyna dropped to 18 points of health. And we don't see any fireballs. We do see a frostball, but we don't see any fireballs coming out yet. Not yet. But I'm sure the fireballs are somewhere there. Northern Rain stick, though. Uh, I've actually was uh, hoping he would hit that, the two one ones there. A little unfortunate. So another question is, do you continue with your onslaught? I think you do kill the minions, because I would not expect... I would actually, I think, attack the 1-1 one -one with the mad scientist and, and try to keep it, unless he is expecting something big and he wanted to, the mirror entity. And yeah, I agree with that. I mean, you could have kept both minions alive then. So, And it's all about board at the end of the day, so if you can get two for one to these minions, it's always worth going that route. Well, this will force Reyna to play into Abusive Surgeon. This is surely more entity. Yeah, you, I think, wasn't Tiddler running Counterspell at via game, I think? I think it's very smart, like running at one uh, secret that's not a entity. Because when, once you know how these decks are built, you can very much predict what secrets are going to come out, especially with Mech Mage, because all of them are mirror entity. So if you just switch one in, catches people by surprise, and Today, um, yesterday, sorry, Crowbar um, got caught very much surpri by surprise with that uh, Doomsayer in their, uh, the matchup against Zosa, so... That warrior deck from Crowbar, I really want to see more of it. Hogger, Doomsayer... Bouncing Blades. Yeah, Corcoran. Faceless Manipulator. <laughs> yeah, we can just go on with those cards. <laughs> but looking at the board right now, I think one of the best ways here is go for face. 
you don't want to take out this uh, this free fall just in case it brings out a doom guard or anything else is scary. So definitely just go with the the, pl the game plan of going for face. I mean, you could even cloak your four free if you want if you still want to play more aggressively. I think that's a valid play. You want to keep the void caller alive because it looks cool and you want to have it on board. Exactly, and you do well. Nothing is better. It's than not winning. cool when it goes when its death rattle comes off. <laughs> oh yeah. And it actually can no work now because there is a, a demon in uh, Reyna's hand. So he freezes it up, so it's not going to be doing much for another turn. <gasps> and he just used his stealth last turn. Ah, no. That's so upsetting. He does have to Frostbolt for turn 9, but that's a while away, yeah. I think here you just go for face with like, you deal 4, you uh, play another Pilot Shredder, and you ping face as well. Like, you won't, you, you'll have to draw into the Fireball. I mean, the safety here is Sylvanas won't death rattle because unless he gets a power overwhelming or something, or a mortal coral if he's running it. Uh, so he doesn't have to worry about that death rattle right now. So yeah, you definitely just go for face and play really aggressive. So one damage to face will leave Reynard at 11. With the Frostbolt. So if he draws a fireball here, it's going to be a lot of trouble. But the Reynard... Oh, another defender of Argus. That's wow. a big draw. That's really, really powerful. But then again, he has Dr. Boom and it's green, so you want to play it. <laughs> it's turn seven, you've got Boom. You're gonna be, you're just going to want to do it, like you said. You want those little Boom bombs. But then again, a 6-6 six, six Sylvanas. So That's, uh, with Taunt? Yeah. That's excellent. Like, this, you can't ask for anything better than Defender that. Defender of Argus. Well, you can't play Boom because then you lose. If there is a fireball, you lose. Like, essentially, if you kill one of the minions of Sylvanas, well, first you can always see what the, what the minion is. But one of the Shredders will survive and will deal 4 damage to you, so you're at 7. With hero power, you're essentially at 6. Fireball kills you. Uh, fireball kills you. If, there, if the minion that drops from the Shredder has free attack, then even Frostball kills you. Yeah, it's a tough turn. I mean, if he decided to leave these alive and just have the 6-6, six, the six, six, at least he couldn't ping it. You'd have to trade both shredders in without a frostbolt, but you can't risk it at this point. That's the problem. Only Gachi gets a uh, taunt on the ink gang bar, so he's going to generate a, a few more minions from this. I mean, that's starting to look uh, quite decent, unless Ten gets some really good top decks. All right, so what do you do here? Do you. That's a, that's a crazy board from Reyna. Yeah, so much really to throw, so much power. You know, like, you can't even kill the gang boss in one go. Like, just Defender of Argus and M gang boss is proving to be super good for Reynard. And it's the second time he did this in the same game. The thing is, he's going to get a minion here regardless. Even if he runs the, the pilot to trade into the ink gang boss and pings it, he gets two one ones and then he drops whatever minion he drops. And even if he trades into the Sylvanas, he'll, he'll take that minion. So if it's a, if it's a Doomsday, that's excellent. <laughs> but other than that, it's looking... Yeah, it's looking pretty tough. How many times people are looking for the Doomsayer? Like, everybody wants to see the Doomsayer. It's I've actually a viable thing in a match. Like, if I get Doomsayer, I win. There is a possibility. This is half turn. I've seen Forsen get a Doomsayer from his opponent, opposing Pilot Shredder. He, Forsen had this amazing play. He innervated Torison, then he did something else, and then he attacked the Pilot Shredder, and his opponent got a Doomsayer. And then he Forsen gave me a look, and then lost. Okay, so... A Juggler? Juggler oh, it's right at home there in Zoo. He just pings it. So this is looking good for Reynard all of a sudden. I think I will ping, ping phase actually. Because if I ping phase and I you know, draw Fireball, that's uh, the sleeful. So that's three knives from Dr. Boom as well. And you're most certainly going to play it here. Oh yeah, you definitely do it. Oh. He's hoping to hit that shield, I imagine. Can Reynard have a lethal situation? Oh, <laughs> that's Thunder Reynard. Oh my god. Well, Reynard, that juggler wasn't yours. You stole it. I don't think I've ever seen someone look so disappointed at Dr. Boom hitting, the, uh, hitting their own board. <laughs> Absolute disappointment from Reynard's face there. Yeah, the salt is real. And the juggler really trolled him. Well. He's still looking good. Like he can't complain about that. Yeah, but I, he doesn't have lethal next turn, so it gives Mage two turns to win the game, two turns to top deck a fireball. 
Captain Durena is so disappointed about this. Like, why? Why is this why happening? Me? Like, he doesn't even get a knife from the, the gangbus now. Alright, so he's going to generate that extra token here. Does he get the knife to use the knife juggler? Somehow, ping into the juggler actually paid off now. Uh, that's not what you wanted to see. Well, there is a spider tank. I think what you have to do... Do you just play Antonidas as the body on board? I don't think so. I th spider tank and pink face. Yeah, you need a top deck fireball to win. So you have to set up for that play. For that for that top deck. Otherwise, you're just going to lose. So how much damage is there incoming? This is um, 9, 11, 15, 18 points of damage. Reina needs 6 points of damage to win. So he needs two power of overwhelming. So he needs to draw the power of overwhelming off the top, and then he needs to tap into it. To or win. power of overwhelming Doomguard. And if there's a minion on board, he can actually attack with the minion into the minion, kill actually, it in space. Is it actually safer not to play a minion here? Uh, yeah, but then uh, you're only saved by the Fireball top deck. But and can you win otherwise? If you play Spider Tank, it doesn't change anything. So not playing a minion is actually a play. Because if he, if he plays Spider Tank, he opens it up for a Boom Bot to hit into it and him hit face. And then he can play like a Doom Guard or something. So if he doesn't play anything, it's actually better. Yeah, that's actually crazy. Like, not doing anything this turn is probably the best play or no play. And yeah, he goes for it. He's fishing for a Fireball. A Fireball top deck is going to win the game for Tang. If he doesn't get a Fireball, he is in a very good spot. Even a Flame Strike doesn't help. So this is do or die. That's not a fireball. So Reynard is going to win the game with his zoo and win the series versus dying three to one. I mean, he was living on a prayer there. He needed one card. We don't have how many cards he's got left in his deck, but I imagine it's within the 15 range. So yeah, he was looking. He was clutching at straws for that win. But Reynard takes it, going three one against Tang. Oh well, man, Tang. using that stealth on a pilot shredder and then getting Antonidas is surely painful. Exactly, because he would have had that fireball he needed if he had played that turn eight. So maybe this, that was the deciding part of the game. So this marks Reyna advancing uh, to play life coach for the in the winners final of of this group. And Tang is not eliminated yet. He will play versus bon, uh, Bonnie Muffin. Bonnie Muffin, yeah. And the the winner will play versus the the loser of Reyna and life coach. Uh, what an amazing match. Like We haven't seen one deck. We haven't seen Druid from Tang. Maybe we'll actually see Druid um, in, the next, in the next match. But uh, wow, Reynard's doing good. And uh, now Reynard versus Life Coach. That would be an amazing match to see. That's going to be an incredible match. And looking at Reynard's decks and now seeing Life Coach's decks, it's going to be very interesting because Life Coach has brought a very control-heavy lineup. Greedy, very greedy decks. And uh, Reynard's decks are quite aggressive in comparison, so it's going to be a... The aggro versus control kind of battle is going to be a very good match. Oh, yeah, definitely. And um, so who, who do you think has an edge, actually? Like, Reynard or Life Coach? Um, from his recent performances, I would say Life Coach. Because he's just been in top form recently. He's just been dominating online tournaments and... Yeah, he's just an exceptional player, very smart. Takes a long time, as we know. He's, he's gained quite a reputation for the time he takes to do his turns. But it is a, is a quality of his. He takes that time. He makes every decision based on the information he gathers from that time. All right. Um, that will wrap up the game on our side. Uh, let's see what the analysts have to say uh, about this match. Thanks so much, Nim Shinaqua. And that wraps up our third series. We're halfway done. What a volatile series that was. That was three to one, but man, there was a lot of heartache if you're rooting for Tang. Admirable, let's start off with you. You have a lot of words to say about that series. Yeah, um, Tang, it's, you know, at some point in this series, you know, we talked a lot about fatigue maybe being an issue in this one. And what it seemed to me is that he was, his indecisiveness is really putting him into some awkward positions here because his game plan is, is he's shifting it for I don't know what reasons honestly it's it's tough to look at these games and figure out why he's shifting his game plan mm -hmm. where at some points he'll be aggressive and then he'll take a very defensive node and then you know maybe he kind of is seeing that he's like ah, I'm being a little bit indecisive and then of course there's like a blunder happened right the quartermaster yeah. <laughs> without actually <laughs> buffing the it's, thing it's like watching it his indecisiveness is costing him so much 
in terms of his just his game plan moving forward. And I feel like it's giving him some positions where normally he'd be very, very favored in the positions he would be getting into and instead is almost falling behind at points. Definitely, yeah. I have to agree with that. The thing is, like, sometimes you're playing a 20-round 20, you know, 20 round game and you're trading nonstop to fight for ball control and you don't realize that you're actually, you know, you're close to lethal. Or maybe this time you could get lethal next turn and set it up. So you just get so, you know, focused on, I suppose, just going, going for that and you don't shift gears. So I think it's very important to have a game plan going, yeah. That's right. So taking a look at a moment of the series, uh, this was something that uh, you wanted to talk about, Caldi. So why don't you break down this important moment? So in... Uh, uh, um, Running blank there. The, the freeze mage versus the paladin. This was uh, game number one. And uh, well, I guess what happened was eventually Reyna just got like the right combo. And it's like at that point... There was just too much. Uh, I, like, is this the point where you have to seize control as the paladin? Like, why it was not floating the board? Like, talk to me, Admiral, about what's going on here. Well, I mean, the way you're going to beat this matchup is obviously you're not going to be able to grind him out. Like, mm -hmm. one of the biggest things he's going to do is he's going to draw a bunch of cards, keep control over his life total, Alex draws you, and then try to burn you out of the game. So you have to just apply a ton of aggression at this point and kind of throw caution to the wind and just hope that things work out really well for you. Right. I, th I think this is probably the beginning point to show that Tang looks. A little bit shaky in his play like you know pilot shredder is what you want to do but all these kinds of moments of indecisiveness was really difficult for him to to try to figure out the right play and it kind of ended up wavering like you said where sometimes he was being really aggressive and then sometimes just like over trading i think it was capitalized or underlined rather especially in that last game the mech mage versus the pal uh mech mage versus the warlock um there's another moment that we wanted to pick out too with the paladin versus the hunter game where that that was one of the most uh, passive ways to just lay down and let the lion eat the prey. That was exactly what happened. He just did nothing. He kept hero powering when he had stuff to do and just fell super far behind on board. There was a point, at least, uh, with the altar there, where he uh, was turn three. He had a mad scientist on board, and he decided to go for the hero power with the altar. I mean, altar generally, I guess, against Druid, et cetera, you want to, like, shut down a five drop. But against Phase Hunter, you just have to play it on curve, because... If you, you know, turn six or seven when you have 10 health and you have eight cards in hand, it, you know, it doesn't do you any good. So you really have to play really aggressively against Hunter, you know, like value doesn't matter. And I think that's definitely a point to bring up there. Yeah, like if you take a look at the way this turn is going to roll out, like this is, you have no choice here. This is obviously a hero power. But it's his next turn where it really comes into a question. Like if you don't draw something like a shielded mini bot or a zombie chow or even a knife juggler, you don't really have another option other than the Aldor Peacekeeper. Right. And so he ends up choosing to hero power in this position. He played like, for value. And, and, right. Which is like something you can't necessarily afford to do here. Right. Like you can kind of take a look at what he's doing. You know, he's hovering over the Dr. Boom. He's trying to signal to his opponent, like, maybe I have some other options. You know, maybe to play a little bit of mind games here. But when you go into this Aldor Peacekeeper turn and you choose the token instead of play Aldor Peacekeeper, Against Hunter, you don't often have a lot of high-priority targets unless you're playing against something like Savannah Hyman. So he may have chosen to go with sort of a you know a cautious turn there instead of going with the Eldor Peacekeeper. But you're basically paying one mana for plus two, plus two on a minion when you play Eldor Peacekeeper there, and you're also reducing the Mad Scientist attack by one. I think a thing to consider when you're playing against Hunter is drawing the one and two drops are just absolutely crucial. And that you don't get a one drop or a two drop, you're, you're way far behind. But you need to also play incredibly aggressive, you know, go face with the True Silver, like just really get the cards out as fast as possible in whatever manner. Like, it doesn't matter if it's, you know, for the maximum value, like you play in many other situations. You just get damage on the, on the board and get minions on the board fast. Yeah, that's right. Uh, and as a result, that Elder Peace Curve never left the hand. It was just like yeah. they're yeah. all game. And it could have been doing three damage per turn for about three or four turns, and that could have been the difference maker. Take a look at the third game, the Warlock Zoo versus the Paladin. Uh, this is we're taking a look here on turn four. Is there anything specifically happening here that speaks to you guys? Well, this turn was pretty straightforward. I mean, this is looking like implosion, but sort of going forward, it was difficult to identify what kinds of turns he should be using Doomguard on mm -hmm. and what turns should he be saving Doomguard and really pushing forward. And the most critical position I feel like he got into this game was uh, was sort of later down the line. Mm -hmm. uh, this wasn't the exact turn, but this is really where it started. Like pretty much every single turn going forward after this one, there is an argument for playing Doomguard. And finding the right spot to play that Doomguard afterwards was really where the fine line was being walked. How is it influenced by the second Doomguard, though, in this case? Like, 
do you want to maximize both value or do you just need the pressure on board and just like say screw it sorry other second doom guard this sorry my twin I'm, I'm i'm doing this alone yeah go ahead it, it's, it's really hard it's it's kind of like having two hooks in hand like you know you can't get value with both of them so it, it depends a bit like on uh actually i i guess you don't want to lose the just the boom i think was the main 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 issue with that yeah, this is really the, uh, one of, where one of the biggest turns came up, and this was excellently played by Teng here. Able to take this uh, this Sylvanas on his own after Raynad was forced to respond to Sylvanas with Sylvanas. Right. And this is really where a big turn came in, is like Doomguard here is apparently very awful, but the question is, if you play the Iron Beak Owl instead, does Doomguard become a good play? What are the chances that my opponent's going to take Dr. Boom if I play Dr. Boom right. here? Like, this is this was the most difficult turn of the game, I think, for me. What, what, no, do I save this for inevitable Tyrion, which is going to be like a wall that I can't get past? My opponent did have Tyrion, but he didn't even play Tyrion. He played Dr. Boom <laughs> instead, and he'll bot, and, of course, the Quartermaster infamously without the actual Silver Can Recruit. That game was wild, but it was yeah. a very difficult turn. You can go back and analyze it, but in the end... Do you think just tapping and playing the owl there was the best move? I think I think in that case, like there's a lot of plays and all none of them is good, you know, it, objectively compared to the turn. But I think the least awful is the going for the awful. yeah. It's actually, <laughs> I mean, every play is really painful and, and not a lot of value. But I think the the best one would be to just go for the doctor boom and hope the bomb hits, you know, and you get right. that possibility of. But it, it's 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 really rough. I yeah. mean, he had booms, bots maybe hitting the phase. He did draw the abusive sergeant right? because you can't necessarily look at that. But he mm -hmm. maybe would have had an opportunity to play the doom guard, buff a little bit, go for that game ending damage. Yeah, he can like tap. Maybe have three small minions and a two doom guards, and maybe you know then it's a one in in three that it'll yeah. get. Who knows? Yeah. Who knows? Although it ended up being okay, though, because that Mech Mage versus Warlock game, let's just briefly talk about it. Way too many trades. Just way too many trades from the Mech Mage. Yeah. There's so many times he could have pressured. Uh, and even then, when he was done pressuring, there were moments where he needed to play for his outs. He wasn't pinging for the opportunity to draw a fireball in the game. Instead, he was pinging the Knife Juggler, which it is a threat, considering how many minions can be played out of a hand of a zoo, but... I mean, it's not considering that you're throwing away your opportunity to win the game. Yeah, indecisiveness really being probably the most crucial in this game mm. out of all of them. And going into the last turn, this, this situation you were speaking of specifically where Tanks chose to ping a knife juggler instead of pinging Raynet's face, who was at 11 at the time, I believe it was, and he had a Frostbolt in hand. So he needed to draw a Fireball and be able to fire, Frostbolt, Fireball, and ping Raynet to deal a 10th point of damage. The board had basically snowballed out of control at this point. There was no recovery option. Pinging knife juggler... All it did was take away one of your turns of being able to draw your right. out that turn and do something effective with it. So the recovery in this position is not feasible, and he's just giving up this point exactly. of damage. You're not like, going to be able to... There's no flame strike. Right. There's no, like, if, frost nova If Raynad has two turns know? lethal right. at the turn you've chosen to ping this knife juggler, and then you draw fireball, you now do not have the damage to kill your opponent if Raynad had a two-turn lethal. And it literally could have been the difference in winning and losing the game. Absolutely. And I think in Mechmate versus Shu, it, you are faster in the early game, but you're very slow in the mid-game as the Mechmate. So you have to get ahead in the early game with the Mech uh, Warper, and then you just have to go face, 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 and finish off with fireballs and pings because there's no heal in Shul, obviously. So I think that's definitely the case. He got ahead in the early game. He started to fall behind in the mid-game as is normal, but he didn't you know, push for, for face and lethal, which really cost him the game, I think. So, uh, well, that's, I think that's a really good example of how some of the qualified players you were bringing this up, when they're new to the tournament stage, they tend to be a little bit too conservative, sometimes making indecisive moves, and as a result, ends up playing uh, a little bit off their game. And I think Tang, maybe he can get that just swept under the rug. I mean, it's a new series that will be playing the loser's bracket, but in the winner's portion of Group C, we're going to have Raynad playing up against Life Coach. So we're going to take a break, and when we come back, more action here from Gfinity Spring Cup.